Wes Anderson is the most imitated filmmaker ever. Yeah. Oh, uh, but there's always been something missing. It's not until Wes is happy with the scene that we know the timing's right. Time was never right. You're saying our mother died three weeks ago? Woodrow and his three sisters, everything about them is split and comped. So there's always a bit of retiming. Every corner of every frame and every action and every prop is, is ripe to get changed. And you know what? If you talk to Wes, he doesn't think he has a style. I know you're my life. You are my dear friend and father. And you're like, no, you absolutely have a style. She's my Russian accent. Yeah, I know. Actually, make a movie like West, you have to understand his meticulous craft and technique. So to break it all down, we invited Wes Anderson's longtime editor, Barney Pilling, who cut masterpieces like The Grand Budapest Hotel, Isle of Dogs, and most recently, Asteroid City. We get a deeper understanding of Wes Anderson's timing. Why the first step Barney makes in any scene is the sound design. The mix of stop motion animation and live action and understanding how Wes Anderson explored grief in Asteroid City. This is the editing podcast and this interview was recorded with Riverside, the all-in-one video podcasting tool. If you're new here, please subscribe. Wes Anderson's style is like, I think one of the most talked about styles in, in cinema today. But I think there's many elements that I don't think people particularly understand because it is quite hard to explain what is the timing of a wes anderson film it's to the metronome that only he hears is the ultimate truth to that i would love to find out how you managed to make all of that timing work this was on an old roll i forgot to develop in the glove box self-portrait with shrapnel Do page 45. You did that, that timing was crazy. perfectly. You just said it perfectly. That was perfect. Insane. Like, you know this instinctually then, but like for you, when yeah. you're in the editing, how did you make that timing work? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he has to think something's wrong. We have to take it in like he's doing. There's pills on the floor. There's a beautiful bottle of perfume there. She's wonderfully made up. It takes you a while to take in what you're seeing. We're upping the stakes there to have that big pause before the Scarlet responds. Self-portrait with shrapnel. Do page 45. There was just intrigue to doing it that way. When we first watched it, we put it together with the sensibility of of how we've normally put his stuff together, which is it's coming at you at a million miles an hour and keep up because we're not stopping. What have you done? How could you? So shouting and crying. Uh-huh. So shout and cry. How could you? We had to really have a word with ourselves and go, no, don't don't be afraid of just silence. How could you? How couldn't I? We often erred on the side of putting a little bit of air in there. Sometimes quite a lot. And then it says I smash everything off the shelf. So smash everything off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, up, we're obviously upping the speed of it, so to have that pause. And we cut to him. And it has a little snickety clack rhythm to it, which is Wes Anderson's uh, humor. It reminds me of what, personally for me, one of my favorite Wes Anderson cuts <laughs> is in the Isle of Dogs. Wait a second. Before we attack each other and tear ourselves to shreds like a pack of maniacs, let's just open the sack first and see what's actually in it. It might not even be worth the trouble. Hi. Right. A rancid apple core, two worm-eaten banana peels, a moldy rice cake, a dried-up pickle, tin of sardine, bones, a pile of broken eggshells, an old smushed-up rotten gizzard with maggots all over it. Okay, it's worth it. This kind of felt like that comedic cut here where, like, it kind of comes in a bit too fast here, like... An old smushed-up rotten gizzard with maggots all over it. Okay, it's worth it. And then it says I smash everything off the shelf. So smash everything off the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> 
this which straight into it. I just like those types of differences. Ultimately, I'll keep saying it. It's not until Wes is happy with the scene that we know the timing's right. You know, when he's happy mm-hmm. with the metronome that's in his head, then we're done. I think it's interesting that you talk about a metronome in his head. Do you feel like there is a a distinct rhythm, equal spaces between every beat, and there's, you know, like a distinct musicality to it? No, no, because how could you put a metronome on jazz, for instance? I don't, <laughs> I think within his within his words, it would be impossible to put a 4-4 four, four beat to it or, or anything like that. I can wrap my yeah. instinct, it's, I'm more instinctively in tune after doing this amount of work with it. It may only be three frames that way and two that way, but until it's been through his filter, I can only get it close. Wes is able, in a superhuman way, to realize when things are off by even a frame. You know, even a mistake. You know, sometimes, Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, editors make the same mistake as me sometimes, where your in and your out point actually can grab a frame that it shouldn't, depending Mm -hmm. on where you park. I put one of them back in and missed missed the last frame of the sequence in there. And he noticed. <laughs> he notices this. It's not like every mistake like that gets pulled up on, but that's the kind of standard of timing that we have to work with uh, on mm. a Wes Anderson movie. Think of the people. Think of the places. Think of the world. Who's your grief? For rehearsal? I'm not even in this picture. I'm a war photographer. Who's your grief? And the music's doing a lot for us here, too. How so? You know, this sort of moody yodeling from the time period just drifting in on the airwaves of someone's radio, Mm -hmm. three chalets down. I value those things as a, as a filmmaker very, very, very highly. It doesn't have to be dialogue. We don't have to be making edits. Just, you know, whenever I step out, put a scene together for worth, I don't even start putting image on it until the sound bed sounds like I'm actually there. If it sounds like you're sat there with them, your illusion is, is, is almost already done. The music is our character at that point, and it's an important one. Most editors probably make the mistake of, let's say, finding a temp track from a soundtrack and put it underneath because they want to help get into the scene they want to create the atmosphere as well but then they start timing it towards the music track it's it's quite a common i would say probably rookie mistake but in this case the advanced technique is actually if you can get the sound environment put all of that underneath then start editing in the dialogue that gets you into the environment and the atmosphere of the scene that's interesting like if we played the offline of this it wouldn't sound hugely different but i think it was even more thoughts and even more on the wind when i did it it really was just a, a little flavor out there wow use your grief even had a small touch just a little sound effect as she hits her head on the bathtub you know we have lovely discussions about that i'm going right what's the bath made of worse are we ceramic is this cast iron would it were we the- you know, we'll have really nice discussions. Is that how do you want this to sound? How should this sound? If we, we talked about it with quite a few editors always love talking about the micro movements. They find those more important than dialogue sometimes. Such a sickening waste. Think of the people. Think of the places. Think of the world you could have seen, Dolores. Some directors choose a push in on different moments of the scene and then they choose in the edit. It's off center framing and then it goes into center. Does Wes like, no, this is the line I want to push in. And in fact, this scene was shot straight down the barrel. So when this scene first came in, he was center frame. They were looking directly at each other in the classic center framed Wes and we offset it. The building of the cottage and the offset was done in post-production. Why'd you make that choice to change it? I think there was always a plan that we'd have a bit of depth. Depth. It was to give it mm. to give depth to the shot and also a bit of storytelling. You know, I think this is a wonderful rumination on grief. Use your grief. At any time we can see real grief in Augie being straight on is it's an exclamation point. Such a sickening waste. You know, I'm very classic. Mm. We we save mm. the sort of close ups for when it matters and I mean just listen to what he's saying. It's beautiful. Think of the people. Think of the places. Think of the world you could have seen, Dolores. It needs to punch that way in this particular moment because he is using his grief. He is taking it seriously and he's obviously moved by it by the end of it. It feels very classical Mm. to do that Mm. at this this particular line. Think of the world you could have seen, Dolores. 
and there were no other move-ins on any of them. It was only ever uh, for this little bit that we, yeah, we're mm. going to do this, and he's he is going to dig into his grief. Uh, then the uh, the and the coroner comes in, orders me out of the room. I slowly turn away and close the door. See, my sandwich is burning. That's a classic, wonderful example of how Wes chopped sentimentality off at the knee. Oof. Hmm. They then play out the most important dialogue scene of the whole movie. This isn't the beginning of something, Augie. Isn't it? Is it? Probably not. Unless maybe it is. I don't like the way that guy looked at us. What guy? The alien. Well, how did he, how did he look like at us? Like we're doomed. Maybe we are. He's moved on. She's left there pondering their, their potential existence together. They get to a point where it starts to feel like this could be an emotional conversation. This isn't the beginning of something, Augie. Isn't it? Is it? Probably not. Unless maybe it is. So then they're both making their excuses and backing the way out of it. I don't like the way that guy looked at us. What guy? The alien. Well, how did he, how did he look like at us? Like we're doomed. It's just another instance of him just avoiding and confronting the emotion yeah. of it. Fuck it, I need to change the subject. What did you just do? I burned my hand on the quickie griddle. Why? It's not clear. Show me. He is just not ready to talk about how he feels and so he hurts himself, which is again, I think that's just a visual he representation of where to. he is. He doesn't know how to because he's been damaged by, by war. Is a kind of a metaphor for one of the main themes for West, that that's what happened to America. It didn't know what the hell to do with itself because everyone's smiling along, pretending everything's great, and a whole generation was totally traumatized. You really did it. That actually happened. So we've been using Riverside for over a year now, and it's simply because they've been a great supporter in making sure that our show gets made. Not all of our guests can be in person. So to make sure that we can still make our show, we've been using Riverside for our remote podcast interviews. Their video quality is bloody excellent. You can record up to 4K. And we've mentioned multiple times before the ease of use of their multi-track recording system. And now Riverside has changed the podcasting game again with a new AI enhanced video editor that radically cuts down your editing time. This just knocks so many hours off like instantly. Riverside's editor means you can make your entire podcast just on their site, such as their transcription-based editor. You can simply search a section to cut and delete it in your video immediately. You can also remove silences with just one click. That's like half the podcast already edited. You can automatically add captions and use AI to clip with Magic Clips. Magic Clips uses AI to identify the best parts of your podcast and then shares them across social platforms. You can create those shorts of your podcast with just one click. Growing your show has never been easier. If you're making any show online, you do need to be using Riverside. Start using Riverside for your show and use the code editing podcast for 20% off. One of the things I did notice in Asteroid City, sometimes working with children can be a bit more tricky, especially if getting their timing can be incredibly difficult. Oh, oh I've got a story for you here. With the spell, Mama comes back alive. But you may have already answered my question. I could tell because of the way that the girls were framed in Asteroid City, they were framed very clearly separately. We hived off a two week period out there on location to work with them under slightly less pressure and figure out how they were going to be together. We also, you know, had backup plans if we thought, no, this just isn't going to work, you know, because they were kind of feral, as you would expect. And <laughs> they'd goof off, they'd get tired, they'd argue, they'd tell each other off, they'd goof around. We'd have to deal with each child individually. Yes, of course. Destroying the, the rotting car. What they're doing is probably three hours apart wow. uh, in real time. We took this little bit, that stone throw, map that off, choose the very best bit that they did and stick it all in the frame all at once. What do you little princesses want to drink? Oh, we're not princesses. I'm a vampire. I'm a mum in Egypt to go up there and alive and came back alive with his head chopped off. Oh, I'm a fairy. Whenever they have dialogue, they are dealt with completely separately. And and often, most times, they weren't even on set together when that was done. There was just one of them and just Wes. There's quite a few shots. They weren't separated. Where Augie is telling them that their mums died. You're saying her mother died three weeks ago? Yes. When did she 
coming back. She's not coming back. And the over-the-shoulder shot or the coverage shot of uh, Woodrow and his three sisters, everything about them is split and comped. You now have to cut cut around the curly hair there because in the take where we wanted this beautiful bit from the sister in the middle, the sister on the right is complaining to the mom and actually talking over it and looking off set. So we've got to slice that bit of the image off. It was incredibly mosaic like that because, you know, they get... They get bored and they get tired and they get hot. And, yeah. You know, you sort of would have a magic two minutes where the three of them mm. would be sort of acting together. But there's some dolly moves and there's some tracking shots where they're just sort of following along in the distance or their periphery and they don't have dialogue where it is the three of them just doing what naturally came to them at that point. And it always that always seemed to work. But yeah, whenever they have dialogue, they are dealt with completely separately. And then it was, no, okay, split them off, take two of them away and just concentrate on one sibling at a time and, you know, go back and forth, prescribe things, look at me, now look that way. And all the wise keeping in his head his knowledge of what they need to be doing and reacting to and timing it out as well as getting the the sibling to behave in a way that uh, that we can deal with in the cutting room. You're saying our mother died three weeks ago? Yes. Is she in there? Yeah. She's in the Tupperware. Cremated. In that scene, you cut to a wide, and then a dog just passes in the background. Yeah, he's separate too. We really edit shots before we edit the movie. When there is wide shots, and there's like, all of these people are very well timed in camera. It's all done in camera because they're all from takes that we've done that day. It's not like we'll mm-hmm. go back the next day and go, right, let's get this dog ten times. We did everything mm-hmm. in one morning. The dog was on set with a wrangler. It was always supposed to be running around the place. Or the cleaner switching the hoover out. You know, all of these crazy distractions that are not helping him be emotional in that <laughs> moment. They were all done on the day. Every corner of every frame and every action and every prop is is ripe to get changed. The dog I can I can picture the mat shape I had to put on the dog already. <laughs> still, I mean, is... I can still see that mat shape. Mm. It has to go to some really quite individually skilled people to deal with that and make it look perfect on film. I'm curious about some of the shots that aren't static. Mm-hmm. The opening shot where you're just going through the town and all of those camera moves are very incredibly well done. Is there any retiming you do on that? It's the desert. What'd you expect? I don't know if I expected one thing or another, but I'm wilting like a cut petunia. Humans don't wilt. You dare me? Dare you what? Tweet this hot pepper. It's an experiment. No, don't do it. That opening shot itself, the 360 as we called it, I think is actually broken up into maybe five segments because wow. you know they perhaps did three versions and by the time we got around to there, the lighting had changed or there was a little bobble on that. So we perhaps did that 25 times and we go, okay, this section from there to there we want from this take. Oh, and by the way, can we just replace the sky completely with the sky <laughs> plate we shot the next day because the sky was spectacular the day after we shot it and we saw the sky and went, why didn't we have this sky yesterday? Can we do the shot just <laughs> to the sky it's almost the first thing i'm looking at if it's not a performance piece is where can i split the frame because i know we're going to do it some somehow how do you make those cuts invisible is that primarily you is that predominantly vfx well i'll give them the roadmap if it can get past wes in the avid then the chances are it's gonna work it'll okay. still be paying for them and they'll still have a lot to do we don't use digital camera moves you know it's sanjay sammy his grip of many many years so there's always wow. a bit of retiming nobody unless you see it would realize just how much work goes into this i mean it's bonkers hey hold up let's take a quick music break This is nice, isn't it? Music is such a key source of inspiration for me. Lots of times I put music on and I just sit and I think and I listen. I'm like, is this gonna work for a scene on my next project? Is this gonna work in this YouTube video? And doing that research ahead of time is a big deal. And when I find something that I know I'm gonna wanna use in a scene, I get pretty stoked, bro. Like, it's kind of exciting. Music bed? is that source of inspiration for me. And recently I have made the switch to Musicbed for my music needs. The reason why I like to use Musicbed as opposed to anybody else is that their curation level is absolutely ridiculous. I've heard that they literally only let 1% of the music submitted to them 
on their service. If it's not a bop, it's not a cop, if you know, what I, you know what I'm saying? They have any kind of genre, any kind of mood, and the producing quality is absolutely ridiculous, like off the charts, it sounds so pro. So pro that you might even find artists that you already like on Spotify, and you could use them in your next video with Musicbed. So make the switch to Musicbed today and experience what is only on Musicbed. Check the link in our description and get a 14 day free trial right now. Back to the conversation. Cremated. Are we orphans now? Huh? Are we orphans now? No. Because I'm still alive. When I was a lot younger, uh, my mum passed away, and I specifically, oh, it's one of my earliest memories. But it's one of my earliest memories of my dad also telling me that my mum passed away. And so for me, that scene was uh, very emotionally impactful for me. It also then took me back to that feeling of like a uh, toughness of a responsibility of a dad, and then just the children sort of simply struggling to comprehend what had just happened. Time heals all wounds. No. Maybe it can be a band aid. These are the things that I do my job for, is to touch people, to bring meaning to stuff, to expose human experience that you might not be able to explain, but let's share it, you know. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that. I think that scene in itself, as well as sort of being the classic tragic comedic Wes Anderson oeuvre, I mean, it sort of represents what the whole movie's about. It really is a rumination on grief. And if you have been able to ruminate on some grief of your own and feel moved, then that's worth more than the box office to me. I was watching it with my brother and we had the exact same experience. And as soon as that scene ended, I turned to my brother and said, you felt that, right? And he went, yeah, I felt that. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, so good. it's- Wow. Yeah, oh, that's great. But I just want to say thank you for that. You've mentioned that I think Wes Anderson kind of goes against naturalism. Like a, a lot of the presentation of the, of the movie is very unnaturalistic, but in a very stylistic way. But for us to have moments where we're challenged with grief or we're challenged with an emotion that we need to uh, sort of tackle, despite the unnaturalism of the presentation, the characters are still very natural. These main sections where all all of them are on stage, kind of traditionally shot, wide shot is completely composited. The coolest thing about it is is the alien himself and the spaceship. You know, they didn't exist until probably three or four months after we wrapped principal photography because they're models. It's all stop motion animation. It's, you know, a good 10 to 12 passes of that thing. You know, mm. what, six lighting passes, six more passes in different lighting for the outside and the structure, and then an exhaustive process of approval to mix all those together so that it kind of looks how we want it to look. You, you talked about having different layers with the stop motion. I'm a little the, bit like, could you just explain that for people who aren't familiar with, with the stop motion and, and yeah. how the compositing all works? This is motion control. Oh, is it like Star Wars? It's a stills camera that's used because it's all stop motion. It's that classic um, motion capture in that you can get the stills camera on a rig that will perfectly replicate the same moves twice. In this case, it's not the camera that's on the rig, it's the ship itself. So the camera's staying underneath this ship and the ship is on a rig which you can have it move in exactly the same way 10 different times or 12 different times. It's possibly six foot, oh, wow. six foot across. You know, there's, wow. it, and it's very intricate in there. And so every element of that had to be done in different passes. It was shot in full, full light, which full sunlight or fully lit so that you can see every single piece of machinery on its outer layer perfectly and they'll put the rig back up again and they'll turn mm -hmm. one set of interior lights on which instantly then makes the exterior skeleton disappear a little bit photographically and then redo mm. it they'll they'll do it around around 10 to 12 times for for every single little element so that we have then have the ability to composite those and take layers of each one of them, take lighting uh, characteristics from others to give it depth, to give it shadow, to give it translucency, to give it scale, to give it a more of a 3D feeling. So if you just did it once, it would probably look exactly like what it is, which is, is you know, a, a model. So each time you see the spacecraft, there's an inordinate amount of layering and compositing to do to give it that kind of luster and depth. I mean, you can still see it 
kind of a model there. We're not trying to kill anybody necessarily. But... <laughs> hmm? I, I think I did forget to breathe during this. Right. And that's kind of what we wanted. And it, you get the sense that they're all doing the same thing. I mean, they're helping mm. with that. <laughs> There's almost two minutes and 50 seconds of absolute zero dialogue. Right, which instantly makes it unusual for a Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, as long as you capture the feeling of all of us, we're holding our breath alongside the audiences. We're in there with them. We're in that crater with them. This scene was so... So much longer than the cartoon version. Really? Yeah, yeah. Once it became real, we're like, no, no, no. We need to hold on this. This needs a lot more space and a lot more air in it. The uh, alien stole the asteroid. And I think also, especially since you talk about timing so much, did you have the music earlier on or was the music made afterwards? No, we had the music earlier on. I mean, we were due to start filming right when the pandemic hit we couldn't film the thing you know nobody had anything to do so they began working on the score remotely and when Alexandre delivers music to the cutting room we get all the stems so we'll get all the elements we'll get the strings we have it all split if need be you know we work fast it's it's a demanding environment technically for me to Mm -hmm. be working as as fast as we need to to get the rhythm right and to sit back and sort of pull your head out of the crazy 20 steps you just did in the last 30 seconds and watch it it's apparent that he's right you know i watched the couple shoe show by him yeah well that's 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 <laughs> funnier now <laughs> <laughs> i think it was a 2018 imac pro eight core so the lowest level and 32 gigs of ram i thought this this would be smoking this would be no problem and it just couldn't cope and, uh, <laughs> after the first after the first six days get on the phone <laughs> I need 16 mm-hmm. gigs of video memory. I need 128 gigs of RAM. I need faster <laughs> chip. I need 10 cores. Everything needs to take a boost here because because of the processing that's involved just in even what appear to be simple shots. That's the best uh, proof of it. Like, oh, it's it's worse. Like, a lot of it's probably done in camera. I probably don't need that much for processing power. But no, if you will have potentially what I'm getting out of this is sometimes eight layers of the same shot essentially on top of and masked all around each other. That is so much power. It's huge demand. It's that- forced me now, you know, what editors are like. We're, we're a bit wary of change and we like our environments and, you know, the whole sort of debate between 2018 Media Composer and everything that came after that and most Mm. of the editors i know including my whole team on asteroid were clinging to 2018 because we liked the interface and we were all Mm. on uh, mojave by the end of the project i thought this can't continue that we're leaving way too much performance on the floor with -hmm. uh, with the new silicon max and thought yeah we could we're gonna have to do this now so we we did i got a silicon mac and upgraded to the latest version of media composer and already i can tell it's going to be a lot easier on the next one because we we've got a lot more power now the transition is so terrifying it's, it's i've been hesitant on the and the nle that I'm, I'm i'm stuck with is like having to make that change and especially for jumping project to project having to relearn yeah. everything yeah. and we need this we need this editing software to fade away into the background we need to yeah. forget that we're using it and so we can right. completely otherwise your brain switching into technical and then being frustrated that it's being slow but that transition sucked. That transition sucked. Do you know so, what? And that's... I, I, when I did it, and it was towards the end of the job, so I was sort of attending mix sessions and grade sessions with Wes. Oh. Wherever Wes goes, the whole movie has to go. Mm. So I have a very compact 96 terabyte four drive RAID, Thunderbolt mm. 4, you know, really good transfer speeds. And it fits in a small Calame lens case. Mm. And I have a laptop. <laughs> and two 4K flat screens that work off bus power. So I can take a three Mm. editing setup with me wherever I go. I mean, it took me a day to go, how do I make the new media composer look and behave more like the old one? But once you've done that, uh, Mm. it's just been 
glorious since then. I wish I'd done it sooner, <laughs> to be honest. With this, as we've mentioned multiple times, this movie is very much uh, exploring grief and how yeah. we're handling it and also how we're sometimes avoiding it and then coming to terms of it and then learning how we can grow through pain. I think how important for you was this movie and for Wes Anderson to really be exploring the story and representing grief and also the creative process? It's strongest uh, characteristic, the movie. And I mm. know, you know, he's become very polarizing, Wes. You know, he's got his staunch mm. supporters and then it, it seems almost de rigueur now that there's a bunch of people in the press and they're just say, ah, I'm kind of done. I'm done with that now. I'm just going to chuck bricks mm. at it because it looks like another Wes Anderson movie. But I strongly refute that. I mean, there's elements in Grand Budapest towards the end when, you know, Gustav H is murdered on the train and we mm. come back. You know, it's that's a profoundly moving part of that film. And it- <laughs> you filthy goddamn fuck my precious asshole! He was one of them. The Wes Anderson style is often the most like celebrated, but I think you're right in terms of this storytelling and what he's trying to explore narratively and emotionally is often overlooked because they're often distracted by the unique style. And you know what? If you talk to Wes and, and he honestly states this, he doesn't think he has a style. Mm. You know, Spielberg would say, no, I don't have a style. You know, I'm very natural. And you're like, no, you absolutely have a style. But he doesn't see it that way. That's just how he sees to tell the story. And Wes is the same. It's still ultimately, absolutely, fully, primarily the words and the characters and the story. So it's our burden in many respects if we can't get past that. <laughs> it's certainly not his. 